Dobro pozdravljati. Dobro pozdravljati. Ok, I know how to start dinner is something like prijat, no, but I am not your dinner, ok? Um, I have uh, a talk about, uh, the talk is about a year old, and now I can say that this is a smart database or a thick database presentation. What we came across was a database with a lot of code in it. So if you use PLSQL or in Postgres stored procedures, this might be interesting for you. We came across a very clever system with a brilliant architecture. And normally I would be in favor of this architecture. I still am actually, but this one went wrong. Okay. My name is Pete. Uh, I am a simple Oracle DBA. You can Google me if you Google simple Oracle DBA. In Yandex, it works, <laughs> even in Yandex. Um, and I, I, I now have also have a simple PG DBA uh, uh, URL, but don't worry. Um, I'm Oracle Ace. This happens if you work with Oracle for 20 years. This is, <laughs> this is my hobby. Um, if I can come back next year, I really want to come by motorcycle. I, I, I go by motorcycle to, to places like Bulgaria and do presentation. Um, these are my customers in the last 20 years or so. If you have a large company with nice colorful logo, <laughs> and you want your logo, <laughs> give me a call. Um, you can call me, we can put your logo on. This, I've, I have done this for one day, worked in a factory, uh, baking chips or dust free. So that was in Singapore, so I have been on top of that building. My job is mostly drinking coffee sitting at the desk. Don't, don't I mean, it's not that glamorous, it is coffee, basically. Um, today is about uh, the smart concept. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of this system, what happened. We had a system that went wrong, we investigated. I'll show you some of the AWRs. I will ask a trick question, like what is in the AWR. Uh, I'll tell you about the application and how it was built. And then you will go, wow, that's clever. Yeah. Um, our problem was in PLSQL, a problem specifically in functions, actually. This is why we also came across the function result cache. We had three fixes for this system. At the end, your homework will be, do you know the three fixes? Can you explain them to me? And there is a little bit more to it if, if we have time. If we run out of time, you can usually catch me at the coffee, at the conference somewhere, trying to get coffee, cookies. Uh, if we have time, I like discussion. Questions, raise a hand. If I don't know, I will honestly tell you I don't know, and then please move on. Uh, this topic, well, it wasn't a DevOps system yet. The system is about 10 years old, and it was much monolithic. System with slow screens, slow reports, slow everything. You probably recognize it. They had consolidated more data in the database, and the next month, the system sort of stopped. They thought, oh, too much data, not good you need to help. And my boss got called uh, first. They had all, so we asked him, what have you done? And then, well, we put it on Exadata. Oh, is that your problem? They literally moved from a VM, a virtual machine, single instance to an Exadata, still single instance. And it had gotten almost exactly three times faster. Hey, I can explain that. Because the CPU in that system is three times faster than the CPU in your old VM. You're probably on the CPU. Um, the user operations were still not good. What they had is, uh, first, they had a, like a minute between certain screens. Press button, get coffee, wait a minute, and then the screen comes up. Not good. That went back to 20 seconds. It was better, but not good enough. Uh, the management wants, who knows, RCA, root cause analysis. Your boss likes those. If you ever come across uh, a file, ETC RCA, either I was on the system or my Malaysian colleagues were on the system and they, they copied my trick. There is nothing in there, just hello, this is the RCA. <laughs> we, system in trouble, we start by observing it and uh, it was, oh, no, it always worked fine and developer totally innocent. No. No. It is an operation, but we investigate, we end up Observing, we use OEM. Who knows Lab 128? Thanks, yes, thanks. Question for the Postgres people. Is there an equivalent of Lab 128 for Postgres? Maybe, okay, I'll, I'll, I'm looking for that more or less. We uh, isolate, we run test cases, we get the AWR, the usual thing. There we go. And, oh, click. 
Yeah, anyone? Clue? Here's the, uh, the top event, 92% of time is spent on the CPU. Yep, and this is why Exadata made it go three times faster, but not fast enough. Uh, we keep looking, uh, we know, so we know it's on the CPU. Uh, we have a very high number of executes. We have a couple of statements with really, we end up doing uh, 10,000 executes here. Who knows what this column is in AWS? Big question, this is the number per second. So I've had, I have 10,000 executes per second. That is, in my opinion, is a lot. Yeah. And yes, on the old VM system, it was about one third of that. It was three times less. So this thing explodes on executes. I had no IO contention, everything was in cache. The database the, on disk was about 50 gig, not that big, fits on a big iPad. Uh, the SGA was just under 10, and we had perfect buffer cache hit, hit ratios, if you wanna know that. Uh, we try to zoom in, what is happening? Well, here is the executions, queries ordered by executions, three million, two million, and then they become strange. I've got double numbers here. I've got 1.1 and 1.1. I have a, a query executed a million times, returning one record, and another query executed a million times, returning two records out of three. The next one, again, two statements, same number of executes. So these were my top executed queries, and the real surprise was here in the numbers, and of course, well, the numbers and the number of records returns, always one record or no records. One record, one record, every, thir every second record, one record, one record, one record, all single record queries. Interesting. What did they look like? There you go. Anyone see pattern? Okay, name from object, code from object, object from object, start from object, one from object, class name from object. Objects. Ah, oh. and this is not the Oracle objects view, this is, there is a table in there called objects. So we begin to look at that. We do a V dollar SQL, what is my most executed query? Uh, select code from object where, blurb, 700 million, select object from object, 28 million, select class from object. So I have an object table and it gets queried in an extreme fashion. Highest frequency is on objects. Those were not the most time consuming queries, by the way, but that, that's a different story. Um, <laughs> let's have a look. So what's in there? Number of, count number of objects. Huh? So uh, millions of queries on this thing. There are only 35,000 rows in there. This fits on, on your wristwatch, you know, this is tiny. Um, okay, explain. So I have this statement, a number of objects, uh, do an explain plan. You know, the next script you run is explain the previous query. And oops, there you go. Uh, view, yeah. um, mm. so objects is not a table, it's a view. And when I did the explain, it went zip all the way to the top. Uh, the explain plan was 200 lines. It scrolled forever over my screen. It was a bit slow connection. You're like, ooh, aha, there is something deep under this object. Uh, let's have a look at dependencies. The object is dependent on one, three, six tables. So I have a view over one, three, six tables, probably, or the DBA dependency thing system. So this view covers one, three, six tables. Wow, that's a good view. Remember, only 35,000 records. Uh, look at the other way, Wh who uses objects? Well, I have 400 triggers using it, 18 package, view, package bodies, nine packages, two views. Interesting. So it is used, this object view is used in triggers and packages. And what else have I got? I have uh, the total schema is 6,000 views, 6,000 triggers, 2,000 tables, <laughs> only 2,000 tables, uh, 4,200 bodies and 4,200, and 5,000 something indexes. A couple of database links, not happy with that, but my problem was not in network or database link, my problem was in CPU, so. Mm. Um, basically, I have thousands of objects in there. In, in Postgres, I'm, I'm Oracle, I would, find this medium to complex system because of the number of objects. In Postgres, do you habitually have system with a thousand tables or is that normal? No. And in Postgres, 
Do you have the same concept of views? Do, you, do they use? I know they have the concept, but do you use it? Is it who's using views in Postgres? Uh, good. OK, so you guys will understand, probably understand the presentation. Um, I was, we were lost. I have one colleague on this together, and we were, uh, what now? now what? We know it's busy on the CPU. Uh, we have uh, millions of executes in, in half an hour interval. We, re whoops, we return one row, zero or one rows on the busy queries. Uh, we, we found out that on the average, each object is returned about 10 times per minute. Nice one was the average fetch, the, the heaviness of a query was about 154 blocks and a millisecond and a half. Um, so we have too much CPU, too much calculations. It's not an IO problem. We keep digging. We were slightly lost. But you dig into a system, you go look for dependencies, and blah. So you looked at all sorts of dependencies. You find a table in there called con uh, control code dependencies. So there was a table with dependencies from the application. The application people had put a dependency table in. Wonder what's in there. So in there is a type and a number of records. There are five dependencies on system parameters, maybe. There is something called a class type, and it has three dependencies. There is a pink report type, 18 dependencies. And then there was a type whatever. And all the other records in that table were of type. There are 1,500 types, whatever. We still don't know what this table means. And the developer said something like, oh, that was an architect a long time ago, maybe not used anymore, forget. OK, so it's not going to fix our problem. No, it's not going to fix your problem. OK, keep going. Um, this is what we found. I'm going to try and explain this. If I, I would like everyone to understand it. If you ask a question, go ahead, ask some questions. We go from, bottom, from top to bottom. It was a very rich application. This application was a lot of generated code. So when they deploy, they have a, a package, also PL SQL. They press a button, they run the package. The package creates statements. It creates the view definitions, and it creates trigger definitions. So some of this is generated code. Nobody types it. It gets generated by a machine. No, no mistakes and a very flexible model. Um, it uses an awful lot of views, and the views don't have columns. The views don't go to table columns. The views call functions. So the columns of the view are not columns of a table. They are function calls to PL SQL functions. That was the key, by the way. So what they do is they select something. The view is both select and join. Most views covered more than one table. And the columns in the view were things like get the name of my thing using a thing ID and return a string. So what the user and the reports of the system saw were mostly strings. Even if it was a number, something like a 3.1459 something, it would still be returned as a string by the function. This system was full of functions. Uh, functions that queried, among other things, that object thing. So in those functions, I got sometimes multiple queries to the object view. And this is why my object was so busy. Now, and under that object are 136 tables. Let me see if there's any, anyone. Everyone goes, nah. it, In a drawing, this is how I showed it to my colleague and later to my manager. At the bottom, I have a lot of tables, small tables. There's a view on top of the small tables. Postgres can do this. There are 2,000 other tables. And by the way, they also have views on them. So I have views, some of them directly to a table. Most views link one main table and do some lookup in the object. So I have views there. And then above those views, I have those packages. Remember, 4,000 something packages. Luckily, only 18 of them depended directly on the objects. And there were also 400 triggers later. So I have packages, stored procedures. Does, is the concept of package known in Postgres? A package is just a, stored, a group of stored procedures. Basically, when I say package, you think stored procedure. You think piece of code, yeah, piece of cake. I have packages. Um, packages, above those packages are my views, the view layer. This is the functional part. This is where the data is displayed for the application and the user. So I've got views. Those views own those, the triggers. So under most of the views, 
is one or more instead of trigger. We used, or the application uses the views and the instead of logic to do its work. This is where the CPU effort goes. You begin to see the problem now. Above those views, there are the happy users looking at screens, and above those views is the reporting system doing an awful lot of aggregates. And aggregates on views that call functions, that call objects, you can see the CPU running. So we've got the, few, the reports there. They had already created M views, and some of the M views took 24 hours to refresh. Ah, yeah, okay, it didn't really help. But it was a good intention. This was my system. This was the architecture. There is a good reason to do this. I, I, I won't go into that in too much detail, but this was a generic system. You could configure this to run in Britain and use BTU, British Terminal Units, it's something like the 1940s. Instead of kilojoules, you could use BTUs. You could use imperial metric, Chinese metric, whatever you want. You can adjust languages in this system, and it goes in there. Very flexible. This thing can do anything. Maybe even bake pancakes on the exadata. Um, it's extremely flexible, but the cost of that is the configuration and all the work in the background. And, and that's where the problem came. Root cause, we thought, is those views querying functions in a package and using triggers. So we have a very rich, intelligent view, selecting function and function and function. In the columns in the view are functions. They, they use an ID, a number field, and a sequence field mostly, and they return an attribute. They display something intelligently. And yes, they, they put names in initial capital and that sort of thing. They query one or more tables. And there is, of course, a where clause with some joins and some conditions in there. This is generic. This is flexible. This can do anything. And uh, the instead of triggers made it even more complicated. I, I was even afraid to read that code, but yeah. OK. This is work. This is work. And by the way, if there are function calls in the where clause, that is additional work. And Oracle is not that intelligent that it would uh, do the function call just once. It will call the function as many times as it's in there. Um, and then you start to join, you put those views together, so you select something from view one and view two from uh, two views, and you need to join that, and you put some filters in, and more, so you've got columns that call functions, you've got joins that call functions, you've got filter conditions that call functions. This poor guy, you can work, 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 and work. And he's just running around. That was my CPU. Um, we looked at it in, in you know, isolate your case. We call one attribute from some table or view with a key. This looks like a good query. You explain that query. Ah, four gets, you know, index with B, B level of two. So two index blocks, one table block. That looks efficient. Good. Then you use auto trace. You look at what's going on in the background. <laughs> Thousands of gets. Because you have no clue what this function does. And that's where the effort is. No. Uh, and then you start doing sums on views like this. And, and all of a sudden, you end up with a report that takes 24 hours to generate because it does a lot of CPU work. And yes, this is single threaded. I could think of ways of doing this in parallel, but that's way too complex. Can you please stop the pictures? I hate my photo taking. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, fine. Um, I learn a lot from the video. I look ridiculous and I speak too quick. Slow me down. Uh, basically, if you have a, something like this with a function, you don't really know how much effort is going on in the back. And, and this, this is where the problem comes in. So, uh, and the boss goes in, okay, so you, you think you know what it is like, can you fix it? So, nah, hmm, yeah, not sure. Um, we came up with three solutions. The first solution is, if this function is calling something simple, and there are only 35,000 of them, can I cache it somehow? Can I use an M view instead of a view? Can I do something clever and put my data closer to my code? A caching mechanism, not caching from disk to memory, but caching inside a code in an array. Y yes and no, because exactly the data that was queried in a screen is probably modified by the same session in the previous screen. So uh, we were really hesitant to, to, do, to build any caching mechanism. If we do our own caching by creating an array somewhere, 
we, uh, we need to code that. We need to create our own code. That's risky. And we still get irregular responses because we need to fill that cache on the first call of the screen anyway. So building our own mechanism with arrays closer to the user, nah. And it would, for, for the purist under you, it would defy the asset property of the database. Because we don't, my array doesn't know when its data is being changed by a screen or a program or a trigger. So that's risky. If you do your own caching mechanism, basically the answer is don't. Don't build a caching mechanism. Postgres can do caching. Oracle can do caching. You shouldn't do caching. Okay. I, know, I know there are telcos with, with cell broadcast systems with cache. That's a huge risk. If you ever receive the wrong cell broadcast message, that's because they coded their own caching in a C program. I was involved in that years ago. So. No. Um, but Oracle has something called a function result cache. And we had the perfect, yeah, anyone familiar? With that? No. Good. Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure if uh, Postgres has a similar, but if you call a function, and, and the function is deterministic, the function can only return one value, and that value is completely determined by what you put in the function, deterministic function. You can cache that. We only have 35,000 records in that table. So we, we could probably use that. So that function result cache, we thought we had the perfect case, and uh, it didn't work. We, we think Oracle bug. My colleague was like, fuck, it doesn't work. You know, this is, this is perfect. It was his idea. It was a perfect use case. And yeah, I think, why doesn't it work? Um, basically, it's not a bug. It is a feature in Oracle. And there is a PowerPoint of about one hour that explains why it wouldn't work. <laughs> and it took us a week or so. And one day, he came in the office and he said, I think I fixed it. So we have a workaround for this, the function result case, next year. Okay? But maybe I want to be Postgres next year. So, so caching, caching was one solution. First didn't work. Later we got a workaround, but it was still our own code. Not really happy with making our own code in that system. There is a second solution to this uh, CPU problem. It's, uh, don't do it. Don't do all the work. Eliminate. Uh, we literally went into the view definitions. You remember the view where there is a function call? You put a comment in front of the function call, and you reduce your effort. If you comment out half the code, you end up with half the effort. We experimented with that. Uh, we found out what the top views, the top sequels were. We find the problem components. It is generated code. This is where we really discovered, wow, clever code. Should we mess with this? Yeah, put a comment and put a comment and yeah, see what happens. We removed columns from views and reports. This was, a, like I said, a system that was very flexible. You don't need the, the, the Polish translation of something all the time. Comment it out, literally. Uh, and imperial units are deadly if you have miles and kilometers, joules and BTUs, you know, barrels and metric tons. You, you, could, you could remove one. Um, we created some clone views, removed the columns that we thought we could do without, and uh, yeah, like this. Okay. And uh, yeah, less calls, less CPU, slightly well, faster reports and screens. It helped. We could find from the M views, we knew where the real problem statements were, so we focused on those and we discovered you don't use all these columns, just put comments in front of them and there you go. And, and th that sped up the system a lot. This is where the users were happy with. It was a fairly quick thing. Basically, the lesson is yeah, maybe you can eliminate code. Maybe you can just not do the effort. Yep. And uh, here is the problem. If you put comments in somebody else's code, next release, you need to find out which part of the code you need to comment again. You need to do this on every release. Not ideal. I don't want to mess with somebody else's code. But elimination basically was in this layer. We eliminate half the columns, or approximately, and there we go. Save on the effort. That was our second solution. So the first one was the, the, ca the function cache. The second one was eliminate stuff. Um, not quite happy yet. There was a third one, um, and this, uh, this was the best possible solution. How do you say Boli umno rechne. No. 
I, yeah, <laughs> go, basically the, 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 clever, the clever solution was to go find your data directly because you, you need them, especially reports. Screens are tricky because people do things in screens. Reports are passive. They need to be printed, screen, whatever. So we go find the data. Heavy reports, critical hyphen, so which kind of functions is, are called often. Can I replace that code with the high frequency stuff in it? We basically went in and we guessed a little of the logic. Dangerous. I don't know the system. I did not design it. It's not my code to mess with. But yeah, uh, it's expensive and hard coded. It's risky. Don't do it. You create a maintenance problem. So you know, improving somebody's system by messing with their code not a good idea. You should go to the developer and have him fix it. But sometimes it works. The bypass is like this. You have the report. You find out what data has to go in, and you go find that data directly. And then when you need decodes and formatting stuff, you query what you think is necessary from the object. You try to figure out what the function is like. And you find what you need. You bring it back to the user, and there you go. Now this, this is probably a Postgres solution as well. I can imagine if you have a difficult performing Postgres system with all sorts of layers, you can just find out what kind of report you need to make make it ask the user, is this good enough? And this is tricky because somebody needs to put a signature and say, yeah, this is good enough. This is, this is the right report. And some of it is guesswork. Like we, we outsmart, we try to outsmart the developers who are in Scandinavia somewhere. Um, so yeah, and that, that worked. That was our third solution, the bypass. So we have the cache, the eliminate, and the bypass. The caching only came in later when we finally got the brilliant idea on how to make the function result cache work. We eliminate an awful lot of the code, we bypass some of the code, and it begins to work. Now, we mess with this code. We can do that because it's in the database, because it's inside one place. If this was in all sorts of jar files, that would be much more difficult for me to find. If it is in .NET components, I'm incapable of reading those even. We could fix this because it was in the database. We, we could diagnose and fix this problem relatively easy because everything was in one layer, so to speak. It was all in the database. You know, the, the diagram shows uh, several layers, the, the views, the packages, the views, and the tables. But effectively, this is one component. And because it's one component, you have a much better chance of diagnosing it. And other things, this system did not have a chattiness problem. You know, the, the traffic between the screens and the database was minimal because it's a simple call of a couple of records to go up and down. There is a lot to be said to put logic and application code in the database. You know, that's the other point I want to make now. One year ago, we didn't even know the, the concept of thick database. By now, there is a lot of advocacy for thick database. Put stuff in the database because then you have it in one place, fairly efficient, you can find it, diagnose it, fix it, maintain it if you need. I'm really in favor of that. By putting this presentation out with all the laughs, it is as if I criticize the people who did this. I don't criticize them. Um, it's actually a very clever system. It just, did a, it just did too much work. I cannot rewrite the total application yet. <laughs> no, not going to do that. It, it is really clever. This system, like I said, can almost bake pancakes. And I don't want to criticize a good concept. The guy who designed it was probably very intelligent. But 10 years down the line, and, and the system was about 12 years old when we messed with it, um, you don't really know how it's being used anymore. You need to think about what happens to the system. In this case, this had started off as something like a few gigabytes of data. By the time it had grown to 50, they had consolidated various factories and, and companies and stuff into it, and it contained too much data. And only then did they discover that it could not handle the CPU load. It was just doing too much calculations. Um, they discovered that way later in the use. What they didn't do is the developers were not involved. The architect was probably left the company. I, I never got to really speak to the guy who thought about it. And from the code comments, I, I cannot find out who it is either. There are a lot of code name, a lot of uh, programmer names in, in the comments. But I don't know who the real, you know, who's the guy to, to hit. You know? um, basically, if you deploy a system, for 12 years, you should look at it from time to time. You should evaluate, are you still doing the right thing? You know, 
I'm, I'm not sure if this was the right solution for, for the system, because it, with 50 gig of data, which I don't consider a lot of data, it, it came to a standstill because of a CPU problem. Somehow it was clever, but not efficient. If you ever build a thick database system, think about efficiency a little bit. Um, and uh, basically, if you can, you have to be able to explain what you're doing fairly quickly to whoever the developer is. At one point, we had a developer on the, on the email who, uh, who was just clueless, who said, no, this is application. This is deployment. This is our code. You should not mess with our code. Said, yeah, I know I, it's your code, but I have to make it work somehow. Yeah. You have to be able to explain, well, you have to, click it. You have to be able to explain your system. If you put everything in the database for the Java or the .NET people, that, that is a bit misty because they don't really know how stored procedures are done. Keep that in mind. Um, I am way too quick here. I eliminated some of the other stuff. <laughs> Postgres. Um, what, do you can, what do you think? Is this, can this happen in Postgres? Do we have any, yeah? Has it happened in Postgres? Any, anyone with a generic system where there is a table called object and a table called attribute? No. If you have a table called object and a table called attribute, I can improve that. I can put your attributes in the object table and make it even better. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Don't do that. Okay. Um, what do you think? No. Any? This, you guys done stuff like this? Is this relevant? I think this is yeah. Yeah. yeah, question. Yeah. So, thank you. It was very interesting. I've uh, worked with uh, generic records. Uh, it was, uh, so we have uh, this kind of generic records yep. uh, and we used uh, dynamic SQL to use it. And it was, uh, it seems to be a good idea in the very beginning. Yeah. And dynamic. Uh, it was doing like pretty different things without uh, need to change it. Yeah. So that was good. Uh, but uh, time passed, for yeah. example, six, seven years. And when you need to add something into dynamic SQL generic records, yeah. it was so painful. Everybody hates to do this. Yeah. So this is a problem about it. Yep. So you can build it, but you cannot change it. Understand, if you have dynamic if you have generic SQL or dynamic SQL where you generate the statement, you have to find a way to spool that statement to a file to debug it as well. That way you don't have to pick it up from the shared pool. And if you do dynamic SQL, one tip is there is a, you can do an execute immediate using tick, tick, tick variables. And then it becomes slightly less generic. You have a better chance of cursor caching. If you put cursor caching to force, I'm fairly sure even in Oracle 12, Cursor cache force is not going to help, but you cannot quote me on that because the manual says it might help. Okay, yeah. I, I recognize that with dynamic SQL, by the way. This was not dynamic SQL, really, but I've had similar systems with an object table and an attribute table and gen generic SQL. Yeah, I recognize that. Anyone else? Uh, yep, yeah. Um, oh. You said that you were uh, in touch with one of the developers yeah. who were criticizing what you were planning to do. Yeah. Uh, but the first uh, two approaches you abandoned. Um, did you have the understanding from the developers who initially created that system if they're just yeah. planning to uh, make any uh, releases to it? Because yeah. uh, if the system was in just uh, last uh, steps of uh, its li lifetime yeah. uh, in terms of uh, further de development and support, probably it was uh, worth to consider just consider the first two options, so abandon some code. Yes, or abandon. Um, did, did, we, did we talk to the developers? Yes. The, the main, there were two problems. The, the people who came up with the concept were no longer there. So what we had was maintenance people, like developers in more or less ops rather than dev. And what they did when they released it, they configured it, they pressed the button, generate new code, and they run that through some tests. So they knew how to deploy the next version by generating and testing and then signing off on all the tests. But we did not have the impression that they understood their own concept in depth. That's one. The other is, because this is a generic system that generates its own code, stuff like translations and, and formatting and uh, unit conversions from, from kilograms to tons and that sort of stuff, um, that is user configuration. Part of the complexity comes from what users do with the system. 
they say, we want this name always in uppercase. And we want, if you tick on this item, we want you to, to put the, uh, the Polish names next to the English names and that sort of thing. That was additional complexity. It was not just the developers, also the user configuration had made it extremely complex. It, it's, a, it's a game. It's an old system, 12 years old. Architect is gone, developers are in maintenance. There is too much data in there. People will say, oh, it was never intended to do a million blah, whatever. Um, and the user configuration itself was probably more complex than it was intended. The message, and thank you for asking, I need to work on this slide. Um, basically, testing, yes, they did, but after 12 years, the system was probably being misused or abused, and nobody was looking at it. So when they put extra data in and, and a slight modification, all of a sudden it exploded on the CPU. You know, there was no monitoring. There was no observation of the system, really. Nobody was, was thinking, is this still right? Is this still correct? Am I still doing correct things with this software? Now, th this is the other part. Even if you build a complicated system, please keep, keep looking at it. Stay involved. DevOps. Anyone? DevOps? No, the DevOps idea is you, st <laughs> you, st you stay involved. You have to stay involved with your system. Yeah. No, does it? Yeah, is it back to question time? Yeah. Can. Is it? Yeah? yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, actually, I saw a software oh. that uh, probably about <coughs> uh, 15 years ago, probably, uh, a bit more, when I worked with uh, EDB, uh, the very first uh, specification. Mm -hmm. Do you know EDB, Enterprise Java Beans? I don't, is it? Uh, oh, AJ, AGB, yeah. yeah, Enterprise yeah, Java yeah, Beans, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, they used to yeah. uh, use a single player for each attribute. Yeah. Yeah, yeah high frequency yeah. queries, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So stuff like that, and it doesn't work at all. Uh, okay, but, but you, could, you have to find out by testing and observing. You have to yeah. stay with your system, babysit it, basically. Maybe that, maybe that should go in the messages. You know. Babysit your system a bit more. Yeah. Anyone else? Am I way too early? Do we have time for coffee? Uh, <laughs> okay. An extra Any? question. Uh, yep. What time did it take for you and your team to get to the bottom and uh, find yeah. the solution? What the timeline? Uh, this was, was uh, less than a month. Uh -huh. the, uh, the initial investigation was total confusion in the first few days. Like, what is going on? And when we finally managed to make that picture on the whiteboard, with the bottom tables and the, the top screens and in between are views with triggers and packages with functions and views on objects and views on tables. The, uh, I need to click, the, this is why I want my keyboard. But uh, this, this, lay, whoop, sorry. This picture took about a week. And, and, and after a week, the picture was not that nice. It was, it was messy. It, it took me, until I made the presentation, I didn't have this nice picture. The, the real system is slightly messy because the, the triggers in here contain logic. There is code in triggers. That's just scary. You know, you, Triggers do stuff. I don't expect, didn't like that. But as, lo as long as we knew that the problem we had to focus on was this object table because the high frequency was part, the, the biggest problem we thought was the high frequency of certain SQLs. And, and those were on the object. And those were done by functions in the package. That's where we focused. You know, that's how we got the focus on AWR. If, if you have AWR and, and ASH and, and tracing, you, you need to look at what your software is doing. Unit testing was important here. Isolate the thing. Um, AWR and careful testing. Th that's how we found it. The whole thing was done and fixed in about a month. And then it took another couple of weeks for the, the function result cache workaround to, to go in. And the developers, the, the software company that, that delivers the it never accepted our function result cache workaround. But that's a different thing. They were happy with solutions number two and three, but they don't really understand function result cache, I think. Does it help? So a month and a bit. And it's still running. And the, 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 the manager, the, the user team leader who was in charge of the team that got the slow screens was a Polish girl from, um, from uh, not from Krakow, but from uh, Katowice. And when the, uh, the Polish user group in September, I, I sort of have an appointment to go and have a dinner or lunch and you know, shake hands with these people. I've never met them, only on the phone and in chat. 
Yeah. Is there a way, a way to exile data every day? Every year? Every, uh, every say that again? Is there a way to exile data? No, no, yeah, they need a new, that, that is a different, uh, uh, actually my presentation tomorrow is partly about uh, buying extra data and yeah, but it's an old story, long story. Uh, the, what, what was nice is that we, um, what, what helped us also was the fact that they had sped up about three times, you go from one minute to 20 seconds, and we knew it was CPU, and I said, oh, well, that VM must have had a CPU of approximately 1400 and then the exadata is 35, so that's a factor of three. Is that right? We, we benchmarked, yeah, it's exactly right. It's three times. <laughs> <laughs> CPU. Um, but, and we were lucky that it, it wasn't something like uh, an I.O. or a buffer busy problem or a locking problem. That would have been probably much more difficult to fix in this system. Is it, yeah, does it help? Can I? Of course you did. I like discussions. If I'm out of time, you know, uh, coffee. But uh, yeah, go ahead. One question. We have um, five minutes. Thanks. So, yeah. Provided uh, you were doing some functional testing to ensure that uh, your custom reports you built on yeah. the tables uh, yes. are exactly the same. Yes. Uh, can you share your experience a part of uh, uh, your own tools you probably developed uh, and side by side <laughs> looking? Yeah. What uh, enterprise or uh, any other solutions uh, you can suggest for the audience? Such, uh, testing, uh, testing, thanks. So, so the question is, how can you ensure good yes. testing of, this is tricky, solutions? tricky. Um, a, a couple of things helped because we knew what those, re we had these M views from the M views and the, uh, we thought what they, we thought we knew what they did. Those M views were based on views here. We focused on those so we could have the original view and our own query and compare them. That's one. So we had comparisons, and the logic in a lot of the, the, the sum, it was aggregate. It was uh, sum by day and sum by month, that sort of thing. So we, we were fairly, uh, we were able to guess or figure out what the report had to be. That's one. The other tools, we have not used testing tools like Load Runner or anything. All the testing, I'm sort of proud to say, all the testing was uh, SQL Plus and Shell scripts in this one. Uh, however, you, have, you do need some sort of automated, you have to make sure your test is automatic. Another anecdote on this one is when they started doing the demos, like can you run the screen for me and I can observe. I was looking with uh, Lab 128 and I did AWRs around the user action. The users need training somewhere in the order of uh, more than half an hour and less than a day. The user needs to be aware that he should do exactly the same thing. And that's not easy. And that's probably easier with Polish people than it is with Chinese who go all the way, a different language. Uh, I speak a few words Polish. I know how to say Jin Queen. Um, but testing has to be automated. That way you can repeat the test. A user test is never repeated. The user will forget, forget a button, uh, press differently, get coffee. User testing, manual testing is not reliable. Okay? You need some sort of automated script. I have a lot of SQL generating test SQL stuff. Shell scripts and SQL scripts. This is my hobby. I, I believe in simple scripts, Unix, Shell, and SQL. I know there are other people out there who will use uh, Ansible or Jenkins and make a complete test street and what have you. I, I need to learn and study that. Automated testing is important because it is repeatable. Manual testing is not reliable. And one more thing about it. If you do testing and automation, the problem with DevOps and those test pipelines is they are fixed. A new error or a new problem is not necessarily found in an existing pipeline. So yes, you need automated testing, and you need a manual eyeball mark one, and every now and then someone behind the keyboard. Does it help? I think, I hope I'm out of time, because I hate difficult questions. Um, <laughs> okay, really, um, it, so if it's not, you know, you have to keep it simple. If it's not, si if it's not simple enough, don't do it. And um, I, yeah, you can shoot me over coffee. <laughs> my, my, my favorite four points, any problem, you can eliminate the code. You can optimize the code. You can run it less frequent, but it will always come back. Or you can kill it with iron, exadata. 
and that is probably not going to help. Yeah. Any? That was my, this is really is my, I'm, I'm finished now. Yeah. You can, the rest you have to look at the internet, what it is and all that sort of, but check, do your homework, know your exercises, keep it simple, yeah? keep it simple. There is this German poet, limitation shows the master, especially in complex systems like this. Any other time? Thank you. Welcome, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>